Hello and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. Today we have the pleasure of having your returning guest. Matt Young was, uh, was we, I interviewed him in episode 133, which is over 150 episodes ago. Seems like forever. And at that time, he we talked about uh, the company that he was running and some of the amazing things that he was doing. And uh, a lot has changed in the last couple of years. And so Matt is going to catch us up on that. Uh, he is an industry leader with over 25 years of experience in the allied health care sector. I won't read his whole bio because I would be here all day. He's had tremendous accomplishments. He is a Guinness World Book, uh, Guinness Book of World Record holder. Uh, that's a mouthful. Uh, Two-time Ironman, 10-time marathon finisher, and a multi-day adventure race competitor. Uh, he and his team have raised over $6.25 million for charity. And so we're gonna talk about that. You know, he's in the sports arena with youth development sports, and, uh, and he's also been able to use that platform to create a lot of good in the world. And so I'm really excited to have him here. Matt, welcome, Lose a Transformation. Thanks very much, Nicole, and congratulations on your success. Uh, it's great to see that so many podcasts have gone by since I was last here, and I, I can't thank you enough for having me on and, and doing what you're doing. My pleasure. And we're in a series right now on how to start a movement. And the reason why I brought you back is because you did. You started a movement uh, through what you were doing, and you are. And right now, actually, it's funny because when we talked previously, because I was thinking about you, and, and I'm going to have another guest on our show here shortly, Frank Fiaming, who so he's also in, in the U.S. in youth development sports and I-9 sports. And so, but when we talked and then you were telling me what you were doing currently, I was like, this is perfect. You know, the idea of how you're bringing people together in the sports industry and so taking it to that whole other level. And so I'm really excited for our movement makers, people that are aspiring to start a movement and or grow their movement and to be able to not just have followers, but to impact people in such a way and inspire them in such a way that they actually want to get involved because that's where transformation ultimately happens. Right. It's not by one person going out and changing the world. They don't do, we don't do it alone. And so, uh, so I'm excited to hear what you have to say about that. And of course, I'm also excited that our listeners are here because you're the reason why we do this podcast is because we want to inspire you to be the difference maker that you're capable of being. And so I would encourage you afterwards is to go on leaders of transformation.com and reach out to us there. Of course, yeah, we have over 300 episodes that you can listen to. That'll keep you busy for a little while with some amazing guests, uh, but also reach out to us and let us know what you're up to so that we can support you in your journey, wherever you are on that uh, on that journey. So um, I encourage you that you can find us, of course, on social media as well and follow us. Love hearing great stories of people making a difference in the world and love sharing them. And, uh, and so we encourage you to, uh, to get co uh, connected to us there. All right. So Matt, let's catch us up a lot. Like I alluded to a lot has happened. Yeah. Since we last, last year, we ended up, yeah, we sent, we sold our business, our personal training business in uh, um, December of 2018. And that really gave the runway for us to get into, uh, for me, what I, what I was now ult uber passionate about, which was really creating quality sport experiences at the youth sport level. Um, very much like when we came into the personal training space and we saw that essentially it was about the celebrity trainer more so than the value to proposition to the client. And the youth sports space was no different. It was a lot about the celebrity coaches and not about the quality sport experience to the athletes. So what we did was we were successful in saying, oh, okay, perfect. We've seen this game before um, and we've got some experience and how can we migrate some of the learnings and lessons and, and you know, innovation that we, we did to this personal training sector and how can we impart those into the, or introduce those into the youth sport training environment. And we've had a lot of success. So. I mean, it really started, Nicole, with our own teams, our own, my, our own son's teams, and, and just sitting and going, what the hell is going on here? Like, what, what has youth sport become? And I mean, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. But, you know, to summarize, the, the, the desire to win at all costs, the focus on the win uh, over the development. And, and listen, I am not 
um, I'm not anti-competition and I'm not anti-winning. I think it's fantastic, it's healthy, it's necessary, but not at the cost of you know, shortening your benches, not at the cost of, of aggregating the best players and then playing inferior components and thinking that, you're, that anyone's getting anything out of it. Not at the cost of what youth sport and community was supposed to do, which was bring the community together. What we're seeing now is it actually pulling the community apart with the academies, with the associations, with the, the rush to get, I call it a race to the bottom, but most people see it as a rush to get that, I don't know what it is, that next affirmation or the, or the university scholarship, or uh, I'm really not sure what it is that that social um, status check mark that says we're, we belong to this exclusive club. Um, in youth sports, to me, that is, it, it's ridiculous. We should be, you know, creating environments of as many as possible, as long as possible, in the best environment possible. So that's what we got into. Uh, we've, we've done lots of speaking uh, nationally, internationally. Um, you know, spoke at the first annual United States Olympic Committee ADM Youth Sports Summit um, last November, I guess it was last December and address some of these issues and how we can um, create a movement and how, how you go about doing that. Where do we start and how do we battle this insatiable appetite for um, the win and the victory um, only and at the expense of what's, what's becoming a, lot, a, a significant collateral damage of kids just, kids just quitting sport. It's not fun anymore. Right. And I remember you uh, talking about that the first time in our first interview, talking about the statistics of kids that were just dropping out of it. And because, yeah, it wasn't fun. They, 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 they found that it was, it was too competitive. And of course you have parents that are living vicariously through their kids and right. all of that going on. Now you mentioned about this talk that you did and what do we do? How do we create this movement? How do we change it? What did you come up with and, and, or suggest? Well, what, what we know in the space is that, um, especially in the sports space, you're dealing with a lot of egos. So it, it's not, you're not ever going to walk in somewhere and push your ideology or mindset on sport-minded people and egos and have them lap it up and say, okay, Matt, yeah, that, that's go, let's do it. Uh, really, it's about pulling people in that are ready, willing, and able to make that transformation. And, and it is a transformation. It is a complete behavior change. Uh, transformation and and that's the issue so typically what happens and what has happened to manage what what's going on in the in the sport landscape is you you know you have a bunch of academics that continue to pr produce research and they research you know to, to, and academics absolutely have a place at the table but you know where I get frustrated is is you know do we really need to research that that the primary motivator and reason and driver for kids playing sport is fun. Do we really need to research that? Like, shouldn't that be obvious? But, you know, it helps. I guess it helps the, the people that um, cling to the excuse, well, where's the evidence for that? Um, but anyway, that's what we're up against. So what, what, what typically happens and has happened in the youth sports sector to write this problem as being a lot of academic, this is what needs to happen, here's a 250 page PDF, you know, this is what you need to do. It's a lot of information and education. And again, it, it's still lacking the activation and accountability. How do we operationalize the academic constructs that have been created so that it actually appears on the field, the pitch and the rink to what we're seeing? That's where the gap is. So it's all well-intentioned. Yeah, we say the right things. Yeah, sport organizations get together and have their annual AGMs and summits and commit to hoorah, we're going to do this. But then where does the rubber hit the road? How does, how does John or Jen volunteer coach take those things and apply them in their setting um, when, when we've gone so far the other way? Um, you know, how do they, how do they deal with parents? How do they manage all those groups? So what we have proposed to get to your, to your question was, you know, really look at this as a behavior change process, number one. And then number two, who are your stakeholders? And I mean all of them, because when we talk about and we ask questions to sport leaders, hey, listen, who are the main stakeholders of sport? First one is the coaches. That's the first answer. Well, we got the coaches. And, and then the parents. The parents are crazy. The parents are crazy. They're all crazy. Well, they're not actually all crazy. 
A lot of them don't know what they don't know. Yes, there are some that are living vicariously, but by and large, I think there's a lot more quality, good kind of parents that just want to be included in the process, assured what's happening is right and safe for their kid. I mean, we know what parents want because there's been studies that have asked that. So, you know, parents want safety. They want fair play. They want, you know, the friendly competition. They want opportunity for their son or the daughter, and they want development. So if we know they want those five things, what we say to the sport organizations is ask them, you know, preseason, one to 10, how are we doing on all those criteria? Give us a rating because then we can use that to inform what we're going to do, our coach education, our practice, what the product is. We'll ask you again mid-season and then we'll ask you again at the end of the season. Standard practice right now is we send out a questionnaire at the end of the season. That has nothing to do with anything parents want. It's basically a validation of the, of the association or the club, which says, you know, did we deliver what we said we were going to deliver this year? Yes or no. So they're those kind of meaningless, absolutely meaningless questionnaire in terms of the value that the parents want. So anyway, stakeholders, athletes, we never even include them in the process. What do kids want when they play? We know because again, it's been studied. Fun, friends, fair play, friendly competition, finish the season with better, more skills than they started. We call them the five Fs. So again, are we asking the children, not their parents, are we asking the children, how are we doing? Are we asking the parents, how are they doing? The officials, which we often forget, but you know what? You can't have any matches if there are no officials. And with this new 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19 parent that feels like they have to comment on everything, um, the retention of officials has gone so far down that they're worried about who's going to officiate now. So we can complain all we want, Nicole, about the circumstances and how we got here. But like you talk about and, and, and the transformational leadership and the movement, we've, we just got to take that pendulum and just move it back a little bit. We don't have to go all the way back to the other side like society usually does. Okay, everyone gets a participation ribbon. No, that's not what I'm referring to. But we need a little bit of a course correction. How do we do that? We understand what the key drivers and motivators of each of those stakeholders are, and we ask them if we're doing a good job, and we're very intentional and specific about how we create the athlete development pathway, the official development pathway, the coach development pathway, and we're checking in, just like you would do with any other, anything really, but for some reason we've never done it in sport, uh, because we just show up, pay the money. The expectation is someone knows what's going on, but the people on the other end are largely volunteers. They don't know what's going on, and they're just trying to do their best. No one's actually taken them and walked them through a step-by-step -step process of this is how you operationalize long-term athlete development or the American development model in your club. And that's what we're trying to do. So when you talk about the movement and you talk about transformation, we're moving away from the complaining about everybody and finger pointing and oh, all parents are crazy, all volunteers suck, just they're, they're volunteers, so we can't ask anything of that of them. No, that's not true. A volunteer fire department fire person doesn't get to drive by a burning house and say, eh, too hot for me, let's keep going. They have a responsibility. We need to hold volunteers to a higher standard. So those are all those examples that I just gave are all examples of what we're trying to do. In, in building that transformative process and create a movement back to quality sport where quite frankly, we get back to putting the athlete experience at the epicenter of everything else because that's what it should be. It's not about the coaches. It's not about how many wins the coaches has or losses the coaches has. It's not about you know which, which one team makes it to the championship every year. There's only room for one of those. And our process and movement um, lends itself to having multiple victories for everybody along that development pathway. So that's what, that's what we're doing. So what has been the response to that as you've gone and talked to, like you mentioned about a lot of times we talk, 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 but in the actual activation of that, what has been the response? And, um, and even speaking to, like, I know you're in Canada and you said you even are working with the U S and, I believe that I read in your the information that you sent me is that this is you've you've taught this around the world. I think there was like 233 countries that are applying some of this knowledge. So um, so what has been the response, and how have you specifically been 
getting that message out? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question. So let's the response first. So the saying is you coach the way you were coached. And, and that is true. And, and unfortunately, it's true. Um, now, as you know, we're in 2019. We, we, things are changing so quickly now that if you haven't brushed up your, your coach expertise from, you know, over the span of two and three months, you're already behind, let alone, you know, decades and decades. So, you know, the, and the problem with the co coaching the way you're always coached is that, that parents don't parent the way they were, they were parented and teachers don't teach the way they were taught. So that's two of three very significant influences on young men and women's lives that have had to change their approach. So what happens is, and what we find is, is that the coach says, you know what, well now that's going to be my job and I'm going to drive, you know, tell your kid about how to be tough and how to be this and how to be that. No, no, no. You know what? That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is providing a quality sport experience for my kid, for your athletes. We don't want you to be their dad. We don't want you to try to teach them things about life, teach them the things about sport uh, and character building in the confines of that sport. They will take that into their lives. So to answer your question, it, you know, it's tough because you got a lot of old school mentality um, that have been doing this for years and years and years and they don't want to change and who's this to, to talk and what, you know, I don't care what anyone else is doing this. You know, I've got this victory. I've got that medal. I've got, you've got a lot of ego. You got a lot of egos and it's really difficult to have, um, you know, a, a really good transformation. You know, listen, if I came onto your podcast and said, I've got a cure for cancer, phone me and I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. You know, I wouldn't be able to keep up. You know, I, we have figured out how to operationalize the process of long-term athlete development and, and, and the American development model. No one's calling and, uh, you know, you get your first followers, but you know, it's not like they're, they're banging down the phone because they'll go, Hmm, well, that's everything that I'm supposed to be doing. It's everything that we know is supposed to be happening, but it's actually not being done at a good level. So it's not as quick as we like on the, on the, the one side, on the one hand, but on the other hand, you get, you get your first followers and that's what you need to start at any movement. And that's really important are your first followers. And you know, I'm happy to report we just got off the phone with the PGA of America today. They're one of our first followers. So when the PGA of America comes on board and says, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do this," and then start showing other people what's happening, well, then people are gonna go, "Hmm, maybe we should get some on that too." So we've we've got some good, you know, in tennis, in soccer, in hockey, we've gone through the process, we've implemented it, we've piloted, you know, pilot, which is Canadian for procrastination, we've piloted the processes. We've got the results and they're all very positive results. Surpri There's no surprise. You put the athlete in the center of it. You, you give him or her a great experience. They report that they love it. They want to come back for more. They develop, they grow, and you're back on track. There's no, it's not rocket science. It's just that sometimes people get caught up. So, um, yes, a lot of good. Other countries, super interested in what's going on. We had great conversations in, in Bazan, Italy, in Liechtenstein, uh, in Austria. We, we were in Norway, um, so we've had a lot of great conversations abroad because everyone is facing this. Listen, there are, are, are some fundamental uh, um, issues that are, are hurting sport participation. Number one is lack of free play. Um, that's kind of zero to five. Um, number two is if, you don't, if you're not out there free playing, not only are you not getting learning the, the, your body and in, in how to use it in space, but you're not making very important neural synapse connections on uh, terms of decision making if i do this it's going to result in this and i did this to get myself out of that so it's it's way more than just a physical ramification of lack of free play it's also a, a, a psychological intellectual ramification as well so lack of free play lack of fundamental movement skills run jump kick catch two-handed throw strike in our increasingly automated environment we just that's being you know marginalized we've got physical education it's being marginalized. Now Nicole gets an A because she can run around faster than everyone else, or Matt gets a, an A because he's really sociable. But what does that have to do with anything with, with progressing skills and movement skills? And movement skills are just important as reading, writing, and arithmetic, but we don't put that emphasis on it. So we've got that. We've got early sports specialization, having kids play one sport all year round. 
Well, that's turning sport into a job for kids. Is that what kids want? Of course it's not what kids want. That's what's contributing to the higher dropout rate. Cost, now these sports are starting to cost a lot of money. So you're not necessarily getting the best players, you're getting the players whose parents could afford to take you to this showcase tournament, to that, to buy this, to buy that, all of those things. And then technology, we know technology is having a huge influence on you know, where are kids spending most of their time, they're getting everything, in the, and I will say that the video game producers are doing a great job of providing fun, friends, fair play, friendly competition, and start over. They're, they're, they've got it dialed. So sport is under attack, uh, youth sport, and if we don't, you know, if, if, we're not, if we don't hop on board a better movement and a quality sport movement, then we're going to be, we're going to be in trouble. So all countries have realized this. It's not specific to any state any province, any country, it's, it's all across the world. We're all dealing with the same thing, which is good, and everyone's looking for that solution. So on one hand, you've got people interested in hearing what's going on because everyone wants to know what everyone else is doing. And on the other hand, the process of actually going, yep, let's go get it, is slower than it needs to be. Well, you mentioned, I remember when we were talking previously, you mentioned that as a consultant in the sports industry, you were surprised at where the time was allocated uh you alluded to it right you know like a lot of talking but where the out where the time was allocated where the energy was allocated in terms of percentage can you talk about that and those percentages oh yeah that's right so you know yeah. when, we, when we asked the executive directors where are you spending your time in sport like in the process of, of operating sport um you know 50 percent was spent on managing uh you, you know politics and bureaucracy um, 30 percent was managing policies and procedures uh, 10 percent was spent managing product enhancement making that sport product better and then 10 percent was uh, spent on people invested in people and you don't need to be a rocket science to see that that is completely uh, skewed where it should be 50 percent on the people and then you wouldn't have to do all the downstream but the problem is society as a whole we're not very good at preventative, proactive, upstream thinking. You know, Abe Lincoln, if I had six hours to chop down the tree, I'd spend the first four sharpening the ax. We'd rather flail away with a dull ax for 50 hours and then complain about the crazy parents and this happening and this happening. And it's interesting, even when we go talk to people, um, no, I can, no time, I, I, I just, we're so, we got so much and then this big issue happened, we've got no time, we'll have to come back and then they never come back. So. It's, it's a, a part of, again, like we said, said earlier, how can we provide that step-by-step -step process um, and, and help those people on board what a quality sport process should be so that, and then get to them and then have them go, hmm, that makes total sense. So if I spend time here, I'm not going to have to spend the time, you know, fielding 50 calls because I've already done this. I've already done this whole process at the front end. So that's really what the, the, the focus of this movement is, is to say, listen, you know, let's be preventative. Let's take the science and the academia that we know. We'll put it through this little filter that we've got, and we're gonna make it digestible for you as the stakeholders. We're gonna bring you all together. We're gonna, we're gonna do a lot of the things that we did in our previous business, and that's going to lead to a better quality sport experience. Excellent. Well. You know what I hear? It's and it's funny. There's a there's a theme as I'm interviewing people for this particular uh, series, but even just like across the board, as I've interviewed people, um, what I've noticed is there's a lot of time. Human beings, we have this tendency to spend a lot of time dealing with symptoms, as opposed to going to the cause, and we could solve a lot of other problems. You know, and eliminate all these symptoms by addressing the cause. But we're so busy looking at the result of that and fixing that. And like you said, so busy, so busy, so busy. I mean, as a, as a coach working with entrepreneurs, I was talking to somebody yesterday and said that very thing, you know, I'm, I'm feeling tired. I'm feeling burned out. I, I just don't feel like I'm getting ahead. So the question is, is what are you, what are you actually doing? How much of your time is actually spent on moving things forward and fulfilling your mission versus a lot of busy work. And I'm hearing that here as well. Now you created a collective so that you could uh, address this and start bringing people in. So talk to us about that 
strategy, why you chose to do it in a collective as opposed to strictly being a consultant and going in, you took it to that next step and said, I need to create this hub, this community where we can bring the different parties together. So talk to us a little bit about that strategy and how that's worked for you or yeah. not, or, you know, where some of the limitations have been. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And so, you know, sure we could go out and, and claim to do everything on our own, but you can't. And you know this better than anyone, um, you know, as a coach consultant, as a business consultant, you can say, Hey, listen, I can help you with your financial. I can help you with your marketing. I can help you with, with your, your business development. I can help you with that. But, but that if, unless that's your real area of expertise, you, you can't. Like right. that's why they have different people. You have a financial advisor, you have an insurance person, you have different people that have different skill sets. And that's what I think is, has been missing. You know, a lot of the critical eye that I, that I would have had when I went to the summits were all these summits we attended were put on by acad academics who had studied something, researched something, packaged it up based on their research that was in a very controlled environment and then try to sell their tools to the general public and there was just they they didn't work because it's not the same thing and it, you know they, the general population doesn't understand that so why not have you know the behavior change expert at the table the academic at the table the marketing expert at the table the communications person at the table and uh, the different genders the different sexes it, it, if you're going to do a collective and i know i'm speaking to somebody who gets this if you're going to have a collective impact be, be intentional about really making it a collective impact, a collective impact. You need diversity. Yeah. Uh, and, and in the sport world, um, you know, it's, 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 it's old white guys. And I'm not suggesting that every old white guy needs to be painted with the old white guy stubborn brush. However, um, you know, there is that, um, uh, uh, bad. It does. It does reason. fit a lot. Yeah, it does fit a lot of them. Yeah, there's not the, all, but stereotype is for a reason. And, and again, it's important not to generalize. And I and I appreciate that. You, you know that too. Um, there are a lot of good old, you know, older white men and women that are do, doing great things. So let's move on from the the that. You know, we don't want to start something new on Twitter. Did you hear what he and she said? Anyway, um, so that's what we need to do. If you're going to start a, if you if you're going to be serious about representing the communities that you're working with well then they need to be there needs to be representation from the communities that you're working with in terms of the ethnicities the diversity you need that and a lot of people give that lip service i know you know that um but they don't actually do it and that's what we need to get to for any movement to be sustainable people have to be able to see themselves in the leadership in the movement so the first thing we did was we created what we called a quality coaching collective and what I did was go around and identify from Canada and the US and a couple of people from abroad who I thought were good servant leaders. They, they were people, and by good servant leaders, I mean they didn't feel the need to have their flag at the top of the mountain doing this. Like me, I solved it, that was all me. They weren't about ego. Um, they're very, very skilled at their crafts both men and women, all different types of diversities, ethnicities, they're very skilled at what they do. So one person's an amazing coach. That, that's his Ben with amazing coach. Another woman is fantastic at how do we get um, maximize not-for-profits in terms of how they're run from, from a business perspective. So, so that's super helpful. Another one's a, a physical health and education instructor, 35 years experience in building curriculum. Another one is a, an unbelievable keynote speaker. So Another one's a videographer. So we went and got that collective and brought these people together and just said, hey, listen, you know, as we go into these organizations and as we go and start talking to these groups, I don't know what they want. But what I do want to be able to do is say, hey, listen, this is a perfect, I don't have that answer, but I know somebody who does that I trust um, that is on our same level of, of, of wavelength and thought and ideology. I will introduce you to them. And so that's been really successful. Um, you know, we did it off the side of our desk. <clears throat> I didn't take a consulting fee from it. Um, that, that wasn't the point. But, you know, last year we did, I think, $750,000 in, in exchange through um, the different people getting together. And now they can refer to each other and, and that can grow. So that's one of the things that we've done. Another thing that we've done is, is again, you know, create platforms um, you know, we, we transitioned to the, for the love of the game platform, uh, where we're inviting all stakeholders to come and see what they should be getting. 
So again, to your earlier point, you know, sometimes people just don't know what they don't know. Uh, how can we equip them with the right information? So, you know, we, we built some, some resources that meet people in the sports sector based on who they are. Are they an athlete, parent, official, educator, coach, or administrator? And where they are, are they new to the game? Are they a returning or recreational player or parent? Or are they high performance focused? And then what we did was we got a whole bunch of different providers to say, hey, these are the most common questions that we're getting. We're actually gonna answer them for you before they become questions or issues. Like, my kid's not getting playing time. How do I properly address the coach? Well, I just go here, there it is. Now I know how to properly address the coach. As a coach, how do I prepare my game and practice planning properly? You go here, you click it. So what we wanna do is provide a, a central hub, if you, if, you, if you will, for information um, that helps people activate on what the big problems are. So not just saying information of, hey, oh, hey, listen, welcome to your hockey experience, but hey, these are the problems. This is how to best deal with them. This is how, what you should be bringing as a parent to the sport experience. This is how you can be a great sport parent. This is how not to be a great sport sport parent. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. And it's been very, very successful and well received, of course. Fantastic. Well, and so you're the spokesperson, if you will, you're the one uh, talking it up and, and so forth. Where do you actually do that? So you mentioned conferences and so forth. Like how do, how do parents find out about this? So I, I, with the coaches, you can go through associations and so forth, but how do parents, uh, for example, find out about it? Yeah, so it, I mean, we're, it's really word of mouth. It's really a parent going and saying, "Oh, I checked out this site. I checked out this area, uh, and it was it was fantastic. I listened to this podcast, and, some, and it's all sport related information." Um, so that's what we've been doing, and and just getting it social media and our partners. So we go to our partners, everyone, anyone we connect with. If we connect with a national governing body, if we're lucky to connect with an, a national sport organization or provincial sport organization. That's how we're saying, look at, here you go. Here's this, here's this kind of central repository for all these questions that are the tough questions. We're going to help you with that. Awesome. So, so I, you know what I envision when you were describing that I envision like, this is this place, like all things around this topic, you're going to be the go-to place. So, you know, in terms of vision, in terms of the future, uh, I can see that being what you're developing there. Um, are there other things that you think that like, let's say for example, something you haven't addressed yet that you feel needs to be addressed that you'll be planning for the future? Yeah, I think, I think, I, well, first of all, I think there's a lot of places where this information and similar information exists. The only difference is I don't think it's as blunt and it as, as helpful as here's how. Like, again, you got the why, what, who, when, where, how. Often we're good in the what and why, but we're not good with the how. So I think that's one differentiating point. The next differentiating point is, yeah, this may exist on a, let's say, Hockey USA, who's done a fantastic job of, you know, parents, officials, information. They got it all there, but that's just hockey. So what about, what about, another, what about a different sport? What about something different? Um, you know, I, so, so I think this hub is, is not speaking to a sport specific. It's create, it's speaking to behavior specific in any sport. So I think that's the big difference. Number one, number two, uh, I think what will be added is all the safe sport requirements. So, you know, both in Canada and the USA safe sports is now, you know, obviously it, it's a, a topic of conversation and people want that. So I think we'll have a lot more of not replicating that safe sport information because it already exists, but pointing people to it. So in the USA, if there is something that, uh, that is an issue in safe sports, here's where you go. This is what you do. Follow them. They're already equipped to do it in Canada. Here you go. This is what you do. So it's really building those, those connections and alliances. Respect and Sport is a great group in Canada. Uh, they've got some great material. Respect in the workplace. Respect in, the, in, in your, your administration culture. Respect in the team. Um, respect as a coach. So they've got a really good, uh, art, you know, services around respect. You get a certificate of completion. So really aligning with organizations like that, I think helps just grow it and grow it so that people go, Hey, listen, if I, if I need anything, if I have a question 
I go to this hub, I go to this spot and, and we'll get it sorted out. Brilliant. Well, and I love the fact that you're not trying to be all things to all people that you're actually bringing in. There's also buy in there, right? So if people are contributing to it, they're going to be much more bought in than if you come with the approach of we know it all and we're going to tell you how to do it correctly or we're going to do it better than you where you're actually and i see that a lot more that's happening like building platforms where there are experts best in class in different arenas that are actually coming together congregating creating these collectives and so they don't actually have to be all things they simply even for, to the extent that you could literally just build a platform and not have any ex personal expertise, <laughs> you know, but that you could, but you could bring together the people that do. And of course you'd need to know something about it to be able to know who those people were, but um, brilliant in terms of, because there's a lot of times like we're talking about, you know, creating movements. There is this natural inclination to think that I need to do it. I need to be the one, I see a problem, I need to go out and do it. And what I notice is there's a lot of silos occurring. A lot of people are trying to do things on their own. It's like they're trying to swim upstream on their own as opposed to collaborating. Again, ego coming in, right? It's like, I need to do it or false perception about that. And this idea of eliminating the silos and creating these collectives so that we can actually make a greater impact together, which is really that is the premise to leaders of transformation and building the community. So I love it. It's fantastic. Where do people find out more about the, uh, this collective? Yeah. Info at quality uh, info at Q coaching collective.com. That's info at Q coaching collective.com. That's where they can find out about that and connect with us and we can lead them to, to, to many different areas. So that's where it all is. Excellent. So for coaches, for parents, for all these different parties, they can go and get this information. You've got free resources and yeah, and yeah. yeah. We'll, fantastic. We'll direct, them, we'll direct them to anywhere they need to go. Yeah. What final thoughts would you have for an aspiring movement maker? You have tremendous, I didn't even cover in, in, in you know, your bio, we'll make sure it's in the show notes, but I mean, you have extensive experience in business, top 40 under 40 awards, many different things that you've accomplished over the years. Um, what would you say to someone that's starting that journey? Yeah, th thanks for asking that. Number one, it's not easy. So it, it, it is not easy, nothing that you don't know, but you're gonna come up against, again, you're talking about behavior change, deep rooted behavior change. Behaviors that have been going on for such a long time, they're not, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen over a year. Uh, it, it might not even happen in your lifetime. So when you're thinking about creating a movement and creating that change, you, you really need to think about it in terms of a long-term, maybe not your kids, maybe for somebody else's kids. And if, if, it's, if, if that's not something that you can get behind, that's fine. If it's not something that you can't get behind and you, it needs to happen with your kids, uh, then don't do it. Uh, do something else uh, because really there's no timeline. You don't know when people are going to um, uh, on board. So that's number one. Number two, get your first followers. So once you have your first followers, work with them. Don't push it on people, pull them in. So say, hey, listen, this is what, we, this is what I'm, I'm looking to do. You, you go out and you throw everything against the wall and you see who comes. And then when you get those people who come, you, you focus on them. Don't focus on who you don't have, which is often what we do. Focus on who you do have. Uh, John Maxwell said it well, the 25-50-25 rule in his leadership book. 25% of the people will be on board with anything that you say right away, 50% will be undecided and 25% you can't taser to think differently. But who do we spend the most amount of time trying to onboard that 25%? Cut them loose, pull the pin, get the caboose off. And your only job is to make sure that those 25% don't influence negatively the 50%. So that's number two. Number three is, you know, again, it's gotta be, it's gotta be bigger than you. Uh, and, 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 what we're talking about, surround yourself with like-minded people. Uh, it sounds really easy, but it's not. And, and I really like what you said about collaboration. Everyone talks the big game about collaboration. And then the minute that something comes up, the minute that there's a paycheck that comes to our, and, and hey, we'll give you 500 bucks. Well, I want that. And then it becomes a competition. And then it becomes those intellectual silos. S sift through those people as quickly as you can. And there's no easy way to do it. It usually comes with a little bit of adversity. 
but get, get, sift through those people and see who actually really means collaboration. Did they get back to you in 24 hours? Do they do what they say they were going to do when they said they were going to do it? That's the easiest way. And, and, or do they give you the, oh, I was sorry, I was so busy. I got caught up in, I blah, 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 I blah, blah. Okay, what do you got? So those are some tips that, that, uh, that will tip off somebody that's not really interested in collaborating. They kind of want to be on the coat tip. Watch what they do on social media. Do they speak in I or do they speak in we? Like all those little subtle nuances are really key to surrounding yourself with the right people. So those are the three big tips that I would, I, I would suggest, you know, it, it, it's not easy, um, you know, be in it for the long haul, uh, you know, surround yourself with, with, with the right, with the right people. Those are, those are three key things to really creating any movement and trans and transformation. Absolutely. And I love what you said earlier about servant leadership and, you know, and I, and thank you for those three tips, because I know that, you know, there are people listening that are going, well, how do I know if that person is the right person? Because there's a lot of people initially that may, may show up and say, that's really good idea. But yeah, again, it's, it's so funny because even on LinkedIn, I've had people who have, who don't know me at all, who will send me messages and say, Hey, I wanted to connect with you. So they'll send me a, a, the, 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 the connection request. And then they'll say, I would love to talk to you about collaboration opportunities. And so I'm like, that's really interesting. You don't know anything about me. I don't know anything about you. And you're saying that you want to talk about collaboration opportunities. What opportunities, what, how do you define collaboration? In my experience, and when people talk about collaboration, a lot of times it's, I, I, we're going to collaborate, which means that you're going to buy into my idea. Right. And so we're talking about something which is a collective, which is actually, it's like co-creating. It takes it to a whole higher level of co-creating it together. And you can, you know, you can create something that much uh, more effective. So awesome, awesome stuff. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it from your experience, being able to share this. It's been, these are like, this is gold yeah, for great. people that are starting out. So I really, really appreciate it. I encourage our listeners and our viewers to go and check out what Matt's doing. We'll make sure that his website is in the show notes so that you can, you can connect to that. Um, and that's the quality coaching collective, which, uh, is, um, I'm just looking to see what the link is here. Can you give it again? Cause I've got the, the hot link, but info at Q coaching collective.com. Excellent. Thank you. And, and so we'll make sure that's in the show notes and, uh, Again, you know, I always say that leaders of transformation take action. You know, you take action on something that you heard today. If you are a parent, start looking at it, you know, this, if you have children that are in sports, what can you do to support them in that? What can you do to get this information to the coaches of your kids so that they can learn more about it? If you're a coach, take action. on. It. There's always some, even if you're just simply, you're saying, you know, I just want to start my own movement. And there's some great tips that Matt has provided here. Take action on those. Use something today. Apply something. Test it out. See how it works. And we'd love to hear your stories on you know, what, you've, what you've attempted to put into action, how it's worked. If you have comments, you have questions, we can certainly pass them on to Matt. Or you can connect to him through his website. Um, but we'd love to hear from you, to hear how this is working for you. And if there are some other things that you need in order to, that we haven't covered, that you, you know, you've got questions, you're saying, hey, what about this? What about that? You didn't cover this. Let us know so that we can make sure that we cover this fully, uh, this topic, so that you have everything that you need to be the difference maker, to be the world changer, the leader of transformation that you're capable of being. Because I do believe, because I do believe that every single person has the ability to make a great impact. We just need some tools, some support, and the, uh, the right community, the right environment around us to do it. So I encourage you to do that. Look forward to hearing from you. You can find us on leadersoftransformation.com. Of course, you can find us on social media. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon.